the Center for Biological Diversity's Food Justice Film Panel. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting with Sanjay Rawal, director of Gather, among other films, including 3100 um, and numerous films. Um, I'd like Sanjay to introduce himself and, and kind of tell us about some of the films he's worked on um, and uh, what he's excited about with Gather. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, be here with you today. And to everyone who's watching this, thank you very much for, for participating. I've only been a documentary, documentary filmmaker for about 10 years now. I worked in human rights for about 15 years. And most of my work involved indigenous communities and village-based communities in Southeast Asia and in Central Africa. And I got a chance to see a different side of life than where I grew up in California and New York. And it kind of informed my approach to filmmaking. Most of my films are um, very adventurous. Food Chains was about migrant farm workers who were collectively organizing against some of the largest buyers of tomatoes in the world. 3100 Run and Become, we spent a lot of time in the Kalahari Desert with San Bushman hunters, with Navajo ultramarathoners on the Navajo Res, and now Gather. And I guess the through line for all of these films has been that my characters themselves are experts. I consider them experts. They might not have university degrees or they might not be perched uh, on a mahogany desk, but by telling their stories, I feel like we can uplift and educate a lot of folks. Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit what Gather is intended to um to reveal about food justice and the food system and, and what kind of people um, you were working with. And, and it's just a wonderful film and it's brand new. It's coming out this month, is that right? It's absolutely brand new. I mean, the interesting thing about the modern food system right now is that it's completely different for every single culture in the world than it was for those cultures 200 or 300 years ago. My own culture, um, I'm East Indian, didn't have peppers, didn't have tomatoes, didn't have potatoes, things that you think of as hallmarks of East Indian cuisine. They didn't have those until colonization brought those goods to them. And where did most of these great crops come from? They came from Turtle Island. They came from the Western Hemisphere. In fact, 70% of the global biodiversity in the food system are from crops like corn, like cassava, chocolate, potatoes, other things that came from native scientists that were cultivated here. So Gather looks at the richness of that food system, but then also at the underlying atrocities that colonizers inflicted on indigenous North Americans in order to subjugate them. And one of the primary tactics, devastatingly, was destroying their food system. Imagine the biodiversity that the world would have now if that wasn't the tactic. At the same time, Gather really promotes a return back to traditional foodways, wherever the viewer might be from. Thank you. And if food access is one of those issues and a loss, the loss of the traditional growing and availability of food as well. And I just found it so fascinating that you're able to you know, bring these voices from indigenous peoples and articulate this in this film that we're able to share. It's just wonderful to hear these voices that we don't often hear and hear these stories that we don't hear. Um, and, and just to see teenagers you know, getting most of their food from the local corner store rather than the traditional ways. And so I really appreciated how your documentary um, explores and investigates how activists are coming into communities and, and really trying to get people back into food sovereignty and growing their own food with their own cultures. I mean, for indigenous communities, as most of your viewers will know, you know, they, most, of them, most of them aren't living on their traditional lands. At the same time, because they were pushed as far away from, quote, urban centers as possible, away from railway lines, they no longer live, or they never actually lived, on supply chains that most of us use for our food. I mean, that's, that's the same with, with inner city America. The sad, the sad thing about capitalism driving calories means that access goes to those who have money. And when you've been purposely pushed away from supply chains and you're at the end of a supply chain, that means the food that you're going to get will cost more than it actually will cost anybody else. 
And if you live in a community like much of Indian country that's economically depressed as well, then those cheap, terrible calories are going to cost even more than they would off of tribal territory. So we look at that kind of confluence of capitalism and the history of trying to destroy native food systems as an apocalypse. One of the characters, Nephi Craig, a chef from the White Mountain Apache tribe says that in the movie, he says that his ancestors survived an apocalypse and his people are now living on the other side. And they have to reconstitute those ancient traditional food ways in this modern environment and make them work for the health, the physical health, the spiritual health, and the mental health of their people. For me as a, as a Californian, um, I was really struck, of course, by the people along the Klamath River, um, the Uruk and the Karak, people who would normally get salmon to survive off of, and it's being impacted by the politics of water and dams and climate change and so on. Is that something you found consistently across the country? Yeah, you know, I grew up in Oakland, California. My dad was involved with agriculture in the Central Valley, and most of us think of California as a breadbasket. And it's not only kind of modern agribusiness that's realized that the richness of California. California supported more diversity in terms of native populations of human beings than any other place on, on earth. As people will know, you know, there were hundreds of linguistically different languages spoken in California. And that's because people didn't have to travel very far for food. They didn't have to trade a lot. California provided a lot in terms of water, in terms of forestry, in terms of environment and habitat for game, as well as the richness of aquatic life, of the coastal life. And in Gather, we follow some kids on the Yurok Reservation um, at the terminus of the Klamath River on the Pacific Coast. As, as you mentioned, there's a dam on the Klamath River and there's a dam on the Trinity River, which ironically supplies most of the Central Valley with its agricultural water. But those dams have essentially choked the river and made it nearly impossible for the Yurok, Kuruk, and Hoopa to fish and to have that traditional relationship with the river that one might say their entire people's histories are, are, are based on. And many activists are trying to raise awareness. What are some of the other things that activists are trying to do to help their people um, achieve food sovereignty? You know, it's, it's a great question. So many of the attacks on their food system have come from outside that one of the best things that can happen to indigenous communities in their fight for food sovereignty is to be left alone. There are so many secrets, there are so many sacred aspects of the food system that if opened up to outsiders, it will become part of the capitalist economy. We went with uh, some Apache foragers, uh, one of whom was in the movie, Twyla Casador, to forage for a very, very unique fruit that only is harvestable or forageable for a brief period every year. They were incredibly, you know, tasty. They were incredibly healthy and incredibly abundant. But if those crops were more widely known, it wouldn't be inconceivable that people in the food economy from Phoenix would travel up to the reservation and buy out most of that crop, a crop that's vital for feeding the San Carlos people. So, you know, there's a lot of traditional indigenous knowledge that's really hyper localized and that needs to remain within the spaces. It's already, it's always been cultivated, at least until those food systems are exceptionally strong and there's some sort of barrier between that necessity to forage and be part of the land and the greater system of capitalism that's always looking to extract resources. And we're living in the capitalist economy right now, so what is it that within that framework or, with, or beyond it, that non-native people can do to help? Well, so I, I, I should say that I'm not anti-capitalist. I, I, should, I should add, however, that it's really only been in the last few hundred years that every single, actually even in the last 50 years, that every single calorie out there has an economic value. Even 60, 70 years ago, you know, millions of, of people living in America had their own gardens. They depended on their own hands and their own um, resources for at least a small amount of, of, of their annual caloric intake. 
But in this day and age, when we're so ensconced and dependent on the capitalism to deliver us food, our choices do make an impact. You know, for those of us who shop at farmers markets, especially in California, there are native farmers out there. And keep in mind that Oaxaca and Chiapan, Guatemalan farm workers and farmers in California come from a traditionally indigenous village structure. So, you know, seek those producers out, learn about their histories, what the ingredients they're, they're selling. Even if those ingredients seem commonplace or, or supermarket friendly, like tomatoes, potatoes, they might have varieties that you've never seen. At the same time, if uh, one of the viewers of, of, of this panel is part of the food supply chain, if you're a purchaser, there are native producers out there that are producing coffees, that are producing um, different types of grains, that are looking to fund their own people's food sovereignty through supply chains, through selling some of their products as commodities. So as a consumer, one can educate oneself and look at the opportunities one has to support indigenous food producers and to buy their products. Chances are those products will be tastier because there's a much deeper food story there than just someone trying to make a buck. Thank you, Sanche. So where can we learn more about you and your work? Well, I'm on Instagram at Mr. Sanjay R. The film is on Instagram at Gather Film, and that's pretty much where most of the information resides. Uh, we also have a, a, a pretty simple website that has all the relevant info, gather.film. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Welcome to the Food Justice Film Festival. Today I'm sitting down with Twyla Castor. Twyla is a San Carlos Apache tribal activist. She has been working tirelessly to restore native food sovereignty with the San Carlos Apache, White Mountain Apache, and Yavape peoples for 25 years. Twyla teaches younger generations about the ancient food ways she knows. Her work also includes conducting interviews with elders to bring information back into the community to address health and social problems, emphasizing the importance of food like grass seeds and acorn seeds to the diets of Apaches before people were moved onto reservations and became reliant on rations and later commodities. Welcome, Twyla. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I just want to start by by learning kind of more about you and, and what you do. And we use these terms food sovereignty and food justice. And maybe you can talk about what that means to you or if you have a better way of looking at it. Okay, when we're talking about food sovereignty, it's mostly for, in the community I'm living in, it's is very hard because if you're looking at the surrounding area, it's about 1.8 million acres and we have one large grocery store in, in, you know, in our community. So when we're talking about food sovereignty, it's, it's very hard because if we had more options in what we want to see in this market, you know, what food policies that pass in our community to help address the diet and the health crisis in this community. I think for food sovereignty, just being able to not be dependent, you know, on how, how would you say, on the commodity food that comes in or the unhealthy foods that are brought into the school system. Some of the school system, you know, I, I believe it's based on budget, but when you're teaching young people about healthy food options, I think starting them very young, you know, I see that with the Head Start program now. They're doing a really great job in introducing um, the young people with fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, you know, and it starts from there. It's just training the young people. And so when they're older, they'll be able to incorporate that in, in a lot of what they'll be doing when they're adults. But right now it's basically a struggle. We have a high rate of like obesity, diabetes, cancer, um, a various amount of health crisis going on in the community, but they're all diet related, you know, and wanting healthy food is costly 
it really is costly. If you if you're not planting, and a lot of people did plant this year, and there was a struggle with the extreme heat in our region, it was like crazy. we I just got done um, harvesting some pomegranates with some some very nice people out in our reservation, and getting some squashes that were able to withstand the heat. But really looking at how are we going to take care of ourselves if this heat continues, and you know if this water shortage continues how do we prepare ourselves these are the ways of you know just creating a picture for people who don't know um about some of the ways that uh the apache and other indigenous people lack access to healthy traditional foods you can't just go down the street and, and have you know whole foods or something like that and and have all this abundance of fresh produce and um so yeah i think that's an example what about mm -hmm. maybe some, some other traditional food ways that have been lost? Well, when you look at traditional food ways, I can't say a whole lot is lost because that knowledge is there. We do have the knowledge there in our, and within our poor communities. The knowledge is there, it's just reintroducing it back into the community. And for some people, they're like, ooh, what's that, you know? Mm -hmm. and and if you were able to preview the you know watching the film gather mm -hmm. you know and you see that and you see um this nephi craig you know and he looks looks at it like as i look and that's basically what a lot of young people look at but when they go home and they talk about it with their older relatives they bring back a lot of life bring back this conversation that's been sitting there for decades that they're just too ashamed to talk about because it was considered poor people's food but yeah it tastes so good I and mean, people have no idea but some food that just stays you know where it belongs and for other people it's just relearning what's out there and how to cook with it that's the exciting part watching young people collect this and mm -hmm. when they make something with it like a soup or a salad or salsa or dried fruit and they're like i didn't know you could do this we <laughs> have it growing everywhere around us you know <laughs> so they give them a different look at what's around them having some young people in a different region um, collect grains that we make flour with the one and they're over there stomping into this area near their school and they're just stomping through everything but once teaching them what this grain is and this plant is and them going back to their classroom they're like oh watch out for that plant you know and they don't look at the plant the same no more the plant has a name now the plant has a purpose they are connected to the plant and that's a really nice um exciting thing watching them reconnect with the plant life is that something you do often is work with young people Oh yes, that's my full-time job. That's all I do year-round. Um, it's all seasonal. I can't really say every season's the same. Like this year, we had the desert desert um, banana yucca. We had a lot of fires this season, so believe me, these these bananas are like hard to come by. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, I went looking out for desert bananas. I was able to find six of them, and I had to drive maybe a good hour, about an hour and thirty minutes all over and go hiking here and there but i was able to find six of them at least i was very thankful for it so you just don't know what you get each season you know and you can't expect it we can't expect mother nature to always take care of us oh mother nature give me all this food you can't it's not like going to a grocery store you just um very appreciative of what food mother mother earth brings to us mm -hmm. and you know She's so giving in so many ways, you know. If I can't find bananas yet, all these other fruits were abundant that I didn't really indulge in as much. Mm -hmm. So having this other food, I'm like, whoa, okay, then I'll go off this way and go collect this other food that's there. So it, it brings, makes me appreciate a lot. Mm -hmm. And it makes a lot of these young people appreciate a lot because expectations are high when some of them go out there and they realize like, oh, this is a lot of walking or, oh, <laughs> I didn't know we had to wait two days, you know, for it to be done cooking. So it's pretty exciting watching, watching um, reactions in a lot of the young people.
Mm-hmm. With a lot of patience and growing. And, yeah. uh, it teaches them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how are seeds a crucial part of this? You know, you do work with seeds. Can you, t- can you talk about that a lot? Yeah, like for the seeds, that's in a whole different area. Like for myself, I just go with what Mother Nature have. I do have seeds, you know, like back here I have some seeds. So seeds are very important because these were gifted to me. So you got the blue corn too. Mm-hmm. Here too. And they stay back here where I protect them and, and keep them with me. These are nice with the black ones. Um, I have a nice, nice one that I love these. So these were given to me. And um, when they were given to me, they were prayed for and said that um, you'll never go hungry, you'll always have food. And it's true. I will only plant a small portion of these seeds. These are the ones that I will keep in here. But these seeds have been with the same people for forever. You know, they've never crossed them over or anything. They've just been the same one. And I'm very blessed to have this part of my family. These guys are part of my family now. And they're going to help take care of us. But they, they were given to me saying that you, you and your family will have food because these are drought resistant drought um drought corn Mm -hmm. and they won't need um how you say an irrigation system or they won't need watering constant water and these are plants that grow just with the rain and i have planted these plants only one time and they did grow and it was amazing i'm like oh they're not kidding so for (laughs) you're looking at today's conditions Mm -hmm. i'm looking more at at, okay, how can we partner with this family and other families that have seeds like this? See, so I personally do not hold seeds. I connect people to the people that have these seeds, mm-hmm. and they will really. It's like it took four years to gain trust to get these seeds. <laughs> so it's not easy getting seeds. I can't just oh, I heard you got some seeds. Can I have some? No, it took building up building a relationship with these elders the community different people it built it took a lot of um, trust building and you never want to you never want to how you say damage that in any way you you want to maintain that beautiful relationship which we which we are doing and i'm really happy and i found that relationship has really I don't know. You can say it just really filled out part of a void that's in a person's life. And it's like, wow, the game we see. It's so, so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a meaningful part of, of you know, your relations um, and community and identity. What is the most inspiring part of what you do? It sounds like working with children is really amazing. Yeah, it is because all our children are seed carriers, believe it or not. As soon as the moment they're born, and you, you with your prayers, with your song, and everything that you feed and nurture them with, you want them to be those seed carriers for their children and the next generation on. So working with young people is giving them a handful of seeds. I'll usually normally give them a handful of seeds and tell them that it's, it's linked to the language, song, ceremony, prayer, and food waste. And uh, those all traditionally. How many of us can carry those five seeds all our life? Not not all of us will. I probably only carry two. But a majority of them is that there's other people that are carrying the other seeds and they'll all meet up. You know, I know it's all going to happen together real beautifully. But they're... I don't know, I could say like these seeds that I'm holding here, these, these seeds, you know, my, my granddaughter's going to be carrying these, that same seed one day and she's going to be planting these, these seeds from this corn here, but not this exact one, but she'll be carrying this and she's going to be telling her kids the same story, you know, and sharing that with the community at that time, past, way past my time, because I always say the work that we do is 
not what we expect to see happen immediately, like next year, or year after, a decade or so. I'm talking about decades. I'm talking about a hundred years from now. What are these children going to have to lean back on? And the knowledge we we're sharing and and restoring and strengthening and documenting is that knowledge strong enough for them to carry, you know? And we want to ensure that each of the what we're teaching them is carried enough for you know whenever. <laughs> and you talked about how you patience and and growing and listening to mother earth and being in harmony and and you also talked about the heat and we had i know what you mean that we had an unbelievable heat here too and um it makes it hard for growing i mean hard even harder for communities um how how are the ways that you're working with food growing food and working with your communities how are those ways do you think more in harmony with with climate change and the environment and you know so we're talking today with a i was talking today with a group of uh, some other people that have planted also and we're just talking about adapting we just have to adapt to the change of the environment we can't say oh please make it rain you know we can't say oh i wish it would stop no it's just part of this life and we're just so used to being accommodated to oh let's turn on the ac it's too hot oh let's you know drive in this car and get us there faster where basically like for a lot of people do we how dependent are we you know on all these other things and so we're talking about we need to show our, our seeds respect there's a lot of them that will endure this type of season and they, and they were, you know, going through their garden and explaining which one did really well in this heat and what did really bad in this heat too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but looking at different food sources and how can we cook with those food sources? What, how can we apply it into the, to cooking, a cooking technique today where we won't have that whole large variety, but we will have something and it's just, learning it's just following this pattern it's not it's just adapting it's really adapting to the environment because it's really up to her <laughs> what would you change about the um the food ways of non-indigenous people in the united states so what would i change um for one is acknowledgement you'll get a lot of non non-native producer will say oh we invented this or we brought this we it's always uh there's no there's how you, how you say no no recognition mm -hmm. towards indigenous people for the food that were stolen basically <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and then they were taken and claimed as other people's food but what would i really change I don't know. You can't change a whole lot because so much has happened. Mm -hmm. And that respect, I think, is, oh my goodness. We're just looking at, there are very few people, you know, very few people in, in the world that keep that balance and I'm very thankful to them. Mm -hmm. But this world has created its own world. And I always reference the fact that like us indigenous people, we're like little ants, little tiny ants in the world that continue, oh, let's go get the grain. Let's go take care of our people. Let's, you know, see what grows, but not really stress on the world. The world's gonna continue to do what it's doing, but how can we adapt to it supporting us with our knowledge, with the knowledge that we have we can build off of that in this small little community. And sharing that knowledge with people throughout the world, that's pretty exciting because you got some people that have so much love and respect that sharing that knowledge, you know, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. I'm very happy 
that to to come across people that I can share share a lot with. Well, thank you so much for speaking. You it was very um, insightful, and, and I'm really grateful for your time. And I'm just wondering, what could people do to help support you and the community work that you do, and and beyond that? I think it's not necessarily supporting me work, but just supporting. Um, other indigenous communities throughout the world. There are so many people that are basically doing the same thing. They are not recognized, they are not seen, they are left under the rug. And there's no acknowledgement for the, what they have to offer. There's so many people within anyone's area that they just have to take a look over and just support them because that's what's going to grow. I was, the way I mentioned is like, um, we're rooting each other, we're, we're plants, and all these plants, you know, how we talk about that. Some people talk about the three sisters, you know, you need the corn, the beans, the squash. That's basically what the world is. We need, you know, A, B, and C to make us happen. So supporting the A, Bs, and Cs of throughout the world is gonna make a lot of beautiful things happen. Not just like for myself, for myself, yes, I would love um funding yes for the western patchy diet project that would be great <laughs> that's who supports me and if you look that up with the western patchy diet project um i work for an anthrobotanist his name is Seth Peltz. he works with the st louis apache tribe with the st carlos forestry program and that's where i presently work under but if there is people in your community, you know, they're doing amazing work and they need support too. Okay, thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the Food Justice Film Festival. Today I'm sitting down with Sammy Genshaw. Sammy is a Yurok native, director of the Ancestral Guard. He's an artist, a musician, a mediator, an activist, a youth leader, and he's a fisherman, and he's featured in the film Gather. Sammy grew up on the Klamath River and resides in Klamath and lives now on the Yurok Reservation. The Ancestral Guard is a community organizing network that encourages an indigenous mindset and engages people in ancestral territories to restore the natural balance between people and the environment. And I'm really excited to have Sammy here and hope he you know, talks about all these things. Welcome, Sammy. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm um, honored to be part of this opportunity. So I'm familiar with the area that you grew up in and that you live in and, and it's beautiful and it's incredibly featured in the film. And I'm so excited about that. Can you tell us a little bit about your own background, where you grew up and, and what food justice means to you? Yeah, so uh, first I'd like to say Ayakwe, which means hello uh, from the bottom of my heart. Nek now Sammy Jensa, Rep Woy, Mate Wimet Chak, Nek Skui Sa, Hall at Maaya. And that means I come from the village of Rekwa and I come here in a good way. Um, I was fortunate to be raised in the same village that my ancestors, my first ancestors in this place, have been raised since the beginning of time um, for the first 16 years of life. And that's been a blessing. And then from there, I started to get involved with some of my first activism cases, which included um, Jinsaw versus Delmar County uh, School District, which challenged racism within the education system within our local communities and really proved positive for a lot of the future generations. Then from there, I, uh, and behind all this, I was fishing on the river anytime we can get. Most of my life was spent uh, on the mouth of the Klamath River. But then I started realizing once we seen the first fish kill in 2002, that something had to be done. As fishermen, we had to, you know, we had to find a way that we can help too. So I dedicated my life, over half my life, to traveling up and down California, doing um, youth leadership trainings and working with our council and fighting for dam removal of the Climate Justice Coalition. Can you tell us a little bit just about that issue? Um, you're very familiar with it. You mentioned the Fish Kill and the Dam Coalition. Can you tell us um, what you're trying to address there? 
Well, the clan of dam removal is an issue that affects thousands of people living within the basin and not only people living within the basin, but people throughout California, because a lot of California's fresh water comes directly from the Klamath Basin and Trinity River Basin. And as a matter of fact, um, these dams that are on the Klamath River have been uh, stopping our people from living a healthy existence for over 100 years. They've been decimating our rivers and really um, inhibiting our abilities to live healthy lives. And it's been affecting us for so long, so long, and it's been um, given to, the government had so many opportunities to make it right, but it took the power of the people to stand up and really let them know what our people need. And I'm thankful for the people who did that before me, who allowed me to step in and learn from what they've done and given me the opportunity to teach these lessons to the next generation. So it's really the power of the people. And once we realize where that power lies, um, ourselves become a better piece of the whole operation that's happening to create environmental justice in our communities. Thank you. And I think also maybe if you can talk a little bit about how your fishing practice align with your cultural and spiritual heritage and, and your sustainable value. Well, you can tell a lot from a person by how they fish, you know, and um, one thing that I was always raised with is always take just what you need and always be ready to give and provide with people who cannot have the same opportunities that you do. Because as a river person, I understand that there's thousands of tribal members that don't even get the opportunity to eat salmon. And so I'm not thousands, but they don't get the opportunity to eat salmon, hopefully somebody's taking care of them and their families and we set up those systems so that happens but there's you know over at least a couple thousand people who don't get the opportunity to go down there catch fish process it learn these lessons and provide for the people as well so by teaching our children these lessons in fishing it connects to who we are as people of world renewal because everything in the Yurok culture comes back to balance and when we talk about balance, we're not just talking about our lives, but we're talking about our relationships with an atomer. And in our language, an atomer is like your family. And so someone that's close to you. And then depending on your relationships with the people who are close to you and how you treat yourself, it should inspire everybody to come together and take care of the land we all need. These are indigenous values that guide our programming on a daily basis. And it seems like maybe that's what led you to found the Ancestral Guard, which I'd love to hear more about. Yeah. Um, honestly, right after I was doing Undam the Klamath campaign, I became the first student community organizer for the Klamath Justice Coalition, traveled to Omaha all across the United States um, to gain the experiences I needed to develop these opportunities. My little brothers were here at home on the Klamath River learning, just learning how to fish. And honestly, it was taken away from my ability to teach them how. I knew they could do it themselves. But one evening, um, they had a, a birthday party and there was no bus the next day. And so we had all these kids at our house. And he said, brother, can you teach me and my friends how to go out and go fishing? And I didn't think twice about it. And I said, you know, yeah, yeah, let's do it. But it turns out a lot of these kids didn't know how to row and they wanted to know about the traditional stuff, how it was back on the day on the river. And we, our boat wasn't big enough. So we went out and we borrowed somebody's boat. We borrowed a net. We borrowed from our community members everything we needed to go down to the river. And we did probably about, you know, six hour river trip that day and teaching boys how to row and set net. We caught fish and um, the boys said, well, you said we're supposed to give them away to elders and stuff. So that's right. And so I called up people and a lot of people didn't want to get their ride all dirty and slimy with our fish chest <laughs> but i called marva jones from the Tolawa tribe and she was the lead of their culture department and she said i'll be right there so she pulled up in her suburban we threw our ice chest in the back and we started doing elder deliveries and that's when people started calling us smokehouse boys because some people couldn't cut up their fish so we started doing it and smoking it for them and so they said oh those smokehouse boys and that's then a lot of people said well, what about girls in the organization and I said, well, yeah, that's true. So we all came together and we developed the Ancestral Guard. And now this Ancestral Guard was started from a youth group 
one of the only self-sustaining youth groups in Delmar County where we'd all do fish cookouts and we'd do presentations and go places and raise money it's just so we can get to the next Undam the Klamath meeting or to stop a pipeline from crossing our river meetings. And it was rough sometimes. We were like digging in the change drawer, you know, but we made it happen. And then um, officially we became a nonprofit about four years ago. And the programming that we're leading with today has been cutting edge in our communities on how we provide resources, especially in food sovereignty. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. And so how do we how do we get to food sovereignty? How do we rid ourselves of the colonial mindset that you talk about a lot and the agenda, the colonial agenda? When it comes to food sovereignty, how do we get towards a, or, or growing our, our food with respect for the earth and biodiversity and, and supporting tribal food independence? Well, how much time we got? <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> I'm just um, but, you know, ridding yourself of the colonial mindset, it's 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 impossible i can't tell you how to do it because all, i myself i'm sitting here speaking fluent english you know we're having this conversation and i'm infected by the colonial mindset but you know we have to acknowledge that you know by you know even the idea of ridding yourself from it it's like being alcoholic and going to church every sunday or something you know there's that it's like you can't hide it but what we can do is we can acknowledge it and we can better ourselves every day and start uh, partaking in practices that teach these values, that acknowledge indigenous um, sovereignty and acknowledge the fact that indigenous people have been practicing land management um, in these lands for thousands of years, you know? And these are the steps, small steps, that can lead to start thinking to be more indigenous and these values that we carry as people. When I say we're people of world renewal, everybody can appreciate those values that's not something that's just not unique to me is first you take care of yourself you make sure that you're physically spiritually mentally healthy and happy and then you take care of the ones you love to your best of your capabilities and if you were able to do this then it should share inspiration to everybody around you to take care of the river systems and in reality these values can be applied to everyday life. What are your, what are your hopes for the younger generation, your generation? You told this great story about your younger brother. What are your hopes and how they can lead the way forward to more sustainable food? Honestly, yeah, how I believe and how we believe at the Ancestral Guard, it's not about my generation. It's not about their generation. When we say the ancestral guard, someone once asked me, what do the ancestors need to be protected? I mean, they're, you know, and I said, well, it's not about the ancestors of our past. It's about the ancestors of our future. These small children and these next generations, one day they will be somebody's ancestor. And we want to make sure that we're giving them every opportunity that they have to live a healthy existence within the territories of their original ancestors. And that's what it comes down to. We have to start thinking ourselves as mentors for these next generations. So with our, with our food program that we started, the Victorious Gardens Initiative, it wasn't me, I didn't come up with these ideas. We went to the community, we asked children, we asked everybody involved who's in the struggle and we came up with solutions that were from the people because this isn't me stepping into a community and saying this is what you need and this is what I believe. This is somebody who was raised in this community who has you know found ways to address these problems and become resilient and how do we make it easier for people to do the same so we have a whole team with that same mentality and that's where it comes from is um finding support and love and being able to trust the people in that community that they understand their own problems and can find their own solutions because in reality when it comes to um these catastrophic wildfires that we're having all over California right now, but you know, it's so red outside. Um, indigenous people have been handling these issues for thousands of years. And then when they look at us today and say, well, why isn't it happening? Well, it's like taking a construction worker's tool belt. You've taken everything that we've needed to take care of these lands away from our people and expecting premium results. This is the race that we're in. Mm -hmm. 
and tribes all over are leading the way still to this day on land management practices, on um, environmental protection and restoration and food sovereignty aspects. And um, yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm sorry, I could talk all day, but that's exactly okay. what. Well, I think that's just just brilliantly put and so insightful and so valuable for people to hear. And I hope that you can talk all day and that people can check you out and follow you and support you more. So, so how can people do that? How can people support you and, and follow you? Um, one of the ways that they can support us and keep in contact with what we're doing is reach out to our Instagram page. It's ancestral underscore guard. We're also on Facebook. You can, they can um, help us donate to our Patreon or mm -hmm. they can go directly to our website and donate to what we're doing there. But in reality, it's just keeping up and taking care of yourselves and not necessarily get involved with us, but get involved with the local indigenous people where you're at mm -hmm. and making sure that we can do that. Okay, I will encourage people to do that as well on the website and I'm just so grateful for your time. Thank you so much, Sammy. Yeah, thank you.